Yeah. All right, good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. We will begin tonight with a public hearing on our budget. Uh, at the conclusion of the presentation, there'll be time for public comment. At this time, we'll ask our CFO, Darren Rice, to make the presentation. All right, thank you. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Knoll, and community members. It is my pleasure to present the 2018-2019 budget. First, I'd like to start out by recognizing the finance staff that is here this evening. We have Ms. Janice Sowers and Ms. Karen Garza. They're both very instrumental in the preparation of this budget, so thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to start each of my budget presentations with our financial highlights uh, from the current year. We're proud of all of our achievements, but we will recognize a few of them today. We just received our preliminary rating from TEA on our first report, and we once again achieved a superior rating for the year ended August 31st, 2017. Uh, the district continues to be recognized from the State Comptroller's Office for our transparency presentations. We received transparency stars for our traditional finances, debt obligations, and contract and procurement presentations. We received a five-star rating from Texas Smart Schools, formerly known as the FAST Report. It highlights success in two dimensions academic performance, and cost-effective finances. Conroe ISD is one of three districts that has received the five stars, which is the highest rating for nine consecutive years. <clears throat> this is our 2018-2019 proposed tax rate comparison with greater Houston area school districts. As you can see on the far right-hand column in the yellow column, that is Conroe ISD, we're proposing a tax rate of $1.28. If you look on the far left, the highest tax rate in the Houston area is New Caney at $1.67. So that is 39 cents above our proposed tax rate. There is only one district in the Houston area with a lower tax rate than Conroe ISD, and that is Houston ISD, and that is just because of their huge property base. This is our 2018-2019 proposed tax rate comparison with our peer districts. This is the districts Humble, Katy, Springs, South Aaron Klein that we compare with each year. Um, our current tax rate of $1.28 is 48 cents lower than our tax rate was in 0506 when it was $1.76. We are more than 20 cents below our peer average tax rate. And we're currently 15 cents below the closest district to us in tax rate, which is, which is Klein. <clears throat> Uh, this is our tax rate history. This chart shows our tax rate history compared to our peer districts over the past 10 years. And during this time, we have maintained an average tax rate that is 19.2 cents below our peer average tax rate. So we're performing very well. Oh. Need to go back. Again, on our tax rate history, and based on our tax rate history, you can see that CISD, mm -hmm. with the leadership of this board, has been an excellent steward of our taxpayers' money. This chart identifies the three years highlighted in green that the board actually decreased our tax rate by half a cent each year for a total of one and a half cents over that period. Our tax rate decreased from $1.29.5 in 2011 2012 to its current rate of $1.28 in 2014 2015. And as you will see in our presentation tonight, we will not be requesting an increase in the overall tax rate again this year. <clears throat> Our comparisons to state averages by function, Conroe ISD spends $7,750 per student compared to the state at $8,637 per student. That is $887 less per student. If we spent at the state average rate of $8,637 per student, our budget would have to increase by $56 million. Um, we run a very efficient school district. 64.31% um, of our budget is in instruction compared to 58.46% uh, for the state. We put our funding into our classrooms. If we spent at the state average rate for instruction, that would mean $28.6 million less for our instructional support. We continue to spend less than half of the state average in our central administration. We run a very lean and efficient organization. In student transportation, that's function 34. It is not highlighted there, but we do spend more in the state in this area. But we have a very large geographic district at 348 square miles, and we have a lot of ridership within our district. 
a general fund balance. This chart represents the fund balance of the general fund over the past 10 years. In 2008, our fund balance was $76 million, and we ended in 2017 at $134 million. During this time, the board has transferred excess fund balance of over $100 million from the general fund to capital projects. These transfers have allowed us to do several large construction projects while avoiding adding new debt. The transferred amounts are identified by year in the red blocks, and the corresponding projects are listed below. We will now look at the major components that drive the budget, and they begin with our 2018-2019 budget objectives. And they include, excuse me, to meet the needs for the 2018-2019 school year, we had a successful opening of Grand Oaks High School and Clark Intermediate. We want to provide a competitive raise and additional salary adjustments for identified areas. And we want to provide additional safety and security at our campuses. <clears throat> and then if any funds are remaining, we want to utilize that surplus to support our capital projects, reduce bond debt requirements, and cover any unforeseen expenditures. <clears throat> our attendance data, our state revenue estimates, and campus expenditure budget allocations rely on our enrollment data. For the upcoming 2018-2019 budget, we're using an enrollment increase of 1,400 students for a total enrollment of 63,014, and we're using 94% for our average daily attendance. It is important to note that the expenditure budget is based on enrollment and state funding is provided based on our average daily attendance. Our enrollment trend, this chart shows our average student growth of 1,500 students per year over the last nine years and our current year estimate of 63,014 students. It's a pretty linear graph. You can see that we can count on about 1,500 students every year. <clears throat> Our certified property values. Property values grew at 5.73%. This growth will add about $1.9 billion to our certified values, bringing our total to $35.7 billion. 58% of our property value is comprised of single family residences. This year, we added 1,279 new single-family residences. These new homes accounted for 29.75% of our growth. <clears throat> per MCAD, there were very few increases to current property owners. And commercial values grew, was over 50% of our increase. I would like to point out the average market value of our house act, uh, homes actually decreased. In 2017, it was $294,906. In 2018, the average value was $293,518. Uh, that decrease is $1,388. So the decrease in taxes for our average uh, value house actually decreased by $17.77. Hurricane Harvey Disaster <coughs> Recovery Funds. The district has a unique, unique opportunity to generate an additional $6 million in state revenue by maximizing our super pennies within the state funding formula. So everybody asks, what is a super penny? A super penny is the term that is used for the state providing additional funding for any M&O tax rate levied above a dollar. Our current tax rate for the M&O is $1.04. We currently access four of these super pennies. However, there are two more additional super pennies available within the state funding formula. However, currently per the tax code, section 26.08, districts cannot exceed $1.04 in their m and tax rate without holding a tax ratification election. However, there is one exception. And uh, the exception in 26.08 that relates to disaster, disaster recovery funds, and I'm going to read that straight from the tax code. When an increased expenditure of money by a school district is necessary to respond to a disaster, including a hurricane, I think everybody remembers Hurricane Harvey, and the governor has requested federal disaster assistance for the area in which the school district is located, an election is not required under this section to approve the tax rate adopted by the governing body for the year following the year in which the disaster occurs. Now the first point is, did we have increased expenditures? Yes, we did. We provided shelters and transportation during Hurricane Harvey. We conducted reappraisals of property for our affected taxpayers. We expended funds for building and grounds repairs. We had extended overtime for our custodial, maintenance, transportation, and police departments. We, provided addi we provide additional transportation for our displaced and homeless students. 
we had an interruption to the start of school, and I don't even know how you begin to put a price tag on that. And we paid our employees for the week that we were required to be off due to Hurricane Harvey. We added additional counselors, social and health services, and instructional support to strengthen our student and community recovery. And then secondly, the governor did declare Montgomery County a disaster area. So we meet both of those qualifications. So how do we access the state funding formula super pennies? We adjust the tax rate between the M&O and debt service funds. We will increase the M&O tax rate by two cents to access the super pennies in the state funding formula. And we will decrease the debt service tax rate by two cents, thus maintaining the same overall tax rate as last year of $1.28. And you can see the tax rate chart that I, that I listed below. This tax rate adjustment will provide an estimated additional $6.8 million in state funding for Hurricane Harvey relief. And we're not talking about a tax increase. We're talking about state funding increase. This adjustment is valid for only one year. So in night for the 1920 budget, our tax rate will revert back to $1.4 for M&O and 24 cents for a debt service, although our tax rate will remain overall the same at $1.28. <clears throat> Other schools that are accessing these disaster recovery funds include Aldine, Cy Fair, Fort Bend, Humble, Katy, Klein, Lamar, Pasadena, Pearland, Spring Branch, Spring, Tomball, and Waller, just to name a few. So now that we have discussed the major components that drive the budget, we will now look at the effect that they have on the budget itself, starting with our 2018-2019 funding estimate, beginning with our tax revenue increase based off of our 5.73% AB growth. That will generate $19.08 million. On the state revenue side, our 1,400 new students generated $2.12 million. Our super penny increase that we just talked about would generate $6.81 million giving us total state revenue of $8.93 million. We're able to increase our investment income due to changes in our investment strategies and interest rates of $1.23 million, giving us a total estimated available funding of $29.24 million. Now looking at the expenditure side of the budget, this is our 2018-2019 salary increase. It includes a 2.5% raise for all professional staff and a 3% raise for our support auxiliary, and police departments. This is at a cost of $9.2 million. We're looking at our approved 2018-2019 teacher hiring schedule. It includes a 2.5% general pay increase of $1,450 and a starting teacher salary of $53,700. Personnel for growth, uh, for support at the campus level to accommodate our 1,400 new students and the opening of Grand Oaks High School and Clark Intermediate. It includes 164 and a half new positions at a cost of $8 million. <clears throat> and these positions are made up of 98 teachers, eight administrators, nine professionals, and 49 and a half paraprofessionals. And then to support our campuses, we're adding 74 and a half new positions at a cost of $2.6 million. And these are mainly for our transportation, police, and maintenance and custodial departments. Overall, we're adding 239 new positions at a cost of $10.98 million. Our safety and security are additional police officers. This chart shows the additional police officers and the equipment and vehicles and training for our additional coverage at our campuses. This is our projected expenditure budget increase for 2018-2019. This is a summary. Our additional personnel for growth is $10.98 million. Our salary increase is $9.2 million. We have an adjustment to our payroll budget of $1 million. We have other expenses that include utilities for the two new campuses, uh, an increase for fuel. As you all see, fuel prices have gone up considerably, and we've added new routes for the new schools and then supplies for the two new campuses and then the overall growth within the district. That totals $3.23 million, giving us a total new expenditures of $22.43 million. So now we're looking at our 2018-2019 proposed budget. <coughs> On the revenue side, our beginning revenue budget is $473.03 million. We have $29.24 million worth of new revenues, giving us a projected 1819 revenue budget of $502.27 million. On the expenditure side, 
Our 17-18 expenditure budget was $473.03 million. Uh, we have $22.43 million worth of increased expenditures, giving us a projected 18-19 expenditure budget of $495.46 million, leaving us with a potential budget surplus of $6.81 million. Uh, the $22.43 million increase is equal to a 4.74% budget increase. And as we've seen in the legislature the past few sessions, they have been wanting to limit the school districts uh, to budget increases that are tied to their enrollment increase and then inflation. While our enrollment is increasing by 2.3% and inflation at the end of May was at 2.8%. Those two combined is 5.1%, so our 4.74% is below that benchmark set by the legislature. This is our 2018-2019 proposed budget summary. And this pie chart shows the budget broken down by major object. 89.2% of our budget is payroll. We're very people intensive business. 5.5% of our budget is contracted services. The largest single item in there is our utilities. Um, supplies and materials make up 3.9% of our budget. The largest single item in there is fuel for our buses. Equipment and other make up 1.4% of our budget. Our 2018-2019 uh, proposed budget is $495,459,113. Uh, this slide just shows the format in which we will be asking the board to adopt the budget later on this evening. And once again, this is our 2018-2019 proposed tax rate. We're proposing an increase on the M&O side of two cents. We're increasing from $1.04 to $1.06. We're proposing decreasing the debt service tax rate from 24 cents to 22 cents, giving us an overall tax rate the same as last year of $1.28. This is a pro forma statement for our 2019-2020 budget, and it begins with the beginning revenue of $502.27 million. And our estimated revenue change inclu includes local revenue uh, estimated at 4% on our AV growth. That will generate $14.4 million. State funding with our 1,400 new students will increase by 15.2 million, but then we'll also have the state funding decrease based on our 5.73% AV growth that we experienced this year. This is the part of the Robin Hood plan. This is the one year lag in our funding, and that will uh, make us lose $19.8 million. The super penny reduction of $6.81 million. Remember the super penny uh, was just a one year time so this is where we're having to take it out of the revenue so a total estimated revenue change of 2.99 million dollars given us an estimated total revenue of 505.26 million dollars uh, on the expenditure side we have a beginning expenditures of 495.46 million dollars we have total estimated expenditure increase of 20.5 million dollars given us an estimated total expenditures of 515.96 million leaving us with a potential shortfall of $10.7 million. And this is an analysis of our fund balance. And we have a stated objective to maintain an unassigned fund balance of 25% of the annual budget. And that gives us approximately three months worth of expenses. Our proposed 2018-2019 budget is $495.46 million. 25% of that budget is $123.9 million. Our estimated unassigned fund balance at 831.18 is $131.6 million, which is 27% of the budget and $7.7 .7 million over our 25% target. This is our proposal for our surplus. We want to save the surplus in the general fund bu budget, uh, general fund balance to support the 2019-2020 budget. We do have a legislative session coming up and there are a lot of unknowns with this uh, legislative session coming up. And we are opening a new elementary school next year. If any funds are remain, we will, per we will like to purchase buses, potential school sites, and continue to support our capital projects program to reduce our bond debt requirements and then cover any unforeseen expenditures. And then in the additional information with the packet, we have our key budget data that we used this year, comparisons to last year. We do have a slide that, that uh, identifies the Robin Hood effect in our budget, our top 10 expenditures, and then also some reference documents <coughs> that are on our website for your, for your review. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rice. At this time, we will accept public comment on the budget presentation. If 
you care to comment, please come to the podium. If you would state your name and then limit your comments to two or three minutes, we would appreciate that. Okay, seeing no takers, that will conclude our budget hearing. <coughs> <clears throat> All right. Call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The time is now 6:20. Please uh, join me in rising while Mr. Sanders leads us in the invocation and Mr. Moore in the pledges. If you so choose, would you bow and join with me in prayer? Most gracious and loving God, we humbly ask that you would protect and guide all the students returning to school, keep them free from danger and harm. We ask that you would place them in the right time at the right place to receive your mercy and grace. We pray they would learn and grow strong Help our students soak up good knowledge and dismiss any negative or worldly messages they may hear. Help them to treat others with kindness and respect. We pray for a year full of fun, learning, and growth for each student. May their interests grow, their friendship strengthen, and their love pour out to others. Bless every family, O oh Lord, and help us to mature as parents and as caregivers. We entrust our children to you, O oh God, every day and give us wisdom to help our students be better. Thank you for our amazing teachers who have given their lives to serve our children. As they lead our children into this new school year, fill them with strength to lead, grace to guide, and hope to thrive for those in their classrooms. Bless them beyond the measure for their willingness to pour themselves into the next generation through education. Remind us, dear God, that you are always with us wherever we go and fill us all with joy and learning session at seven o'clock thank y'all for your patience um i really personally appreciate it uh we're going to defer item 2a special district recognition the woodlands high school uil class 6a lone star cup winner since uh several of them i believe had a playoff game to get to and and there was a lot going on tonight we will go ahead and go to item 2b special district recognition recognized law enforcement agency award conroe isd police department dr Knoll. all right dr hines will present that item good evening again we certainly apologize for that delay um president bush members of the board of trustees Dr. No, it is uh, an honor and a privilege to be able to bring forward tonight as an item uh, for recognition of our police department, of our Conroe Independent School District Police Department, for receiving the recognized Law Enforcement Agency Award from the Texas Police Chiefs Association's Law Enforcement Recognition Program. And this recognition program this is actually the second time that our police department has earned that uh, distinction. The recognition program evaluates a police department's compliance with over 168 best business practices for Texas law enforcement that were developed by the Texas law enforcement professionals to assist agencies in the efficient and effective delivery of service and the protection of individual rights. The best practices cover all aspects of law enforcement operations, including use of force, protection of citizen rights, vehicle pursuits, property and evidence management, and patrol and investigative operations. The Conroe Independent School District Police Department voluntarily conducted a critical self-review of its policies, procedures, facilities, and operations beginning in January of 2013. And the process included preparing proofs of compliance for each of the best practices, as well as submitting to an outside audit review. And in July of 2014, the, our police department was, achieved its recognized status and it was only the 102nd agency to earn this distinction in texas uh, in addition to the ongoing proof of compliance with program standards every four years uh, recognized law enforcement agencies undergo an external audit to ensure compliance with all best practices put forth by the texas law enforcement recognition program to receive renewed recognition status and in july of this year we received notification that again, our police department um, was, um, has achieved the recognized status and is now 
one of 145 having recognized status and only eight of those being school district police departments. So awesome. it is really an honor and it represents a lot of hard work and um, putting in a lot of procedures and processes. And, um, and I think to present the award is Mr. Scott Kidd and Chief Harness and he has his command staff here, but if you'll come forward and to make the presentation for Chief Harness, we're um, very proud of our dedicated uh, law enforcement staff and they're a big part of our school district so I'll turn it over to you. I look at all these board members and I know security and safety of our kids and our entire staff is on the top of our priority list and thankfulness gratefulness uh, just overwhelmed and just proud that we have one of the best groups in the state and, and I, you know it's I don't know if it was overlooked but I know you've been working on this for years and to maintain this rating and we're just extremely grateful for this opportunity to acknowledge the hard work and acknowledge what you do for this community for our kids and for our entire staff from a from a personal standpoint I was uh, a couple weeks ago moving our my wife and I were moving our first grade teach your daughter into her class up in another district and she was showing us the escape route uh, to the library for the first grade class and that hit me again just like what hits me when we read these articles about what's going on about the world we live in uh, so I pray for her every day uh, I know we all pray for our kids pray for safety every day and what I can commit to you is with this recognition with this honor that we give you more importantly this board the entire leadership of CISD we give you our backing we give you our support we give you our love and most importantly we want to cover you with consistent prayer and anybody that will join me consistent prayer for you guys for the safety of our schools and the safety of our kids throughout this school year and throughout the years to come thank you Ms. Godfrey, has anyone registered to address the board? Yes. The next 30 minutes have been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not act upon or discuss any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district's complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those that, who have registered to address the board will be limited to five minutes for the presentation, and delegations of more than five must appoint one representative to present their views to the board. Ms. Godfrey, please call the first person who has signed up to address the board. Patrice Ward. Hi, good evening. My name is Patrice Ward. My daughter is Inez Alvarez Ward. Uh, she is a new student to the Woodlands High School, 10th grade. She has an IEP for an emotional disturbance. 
So her IEP has accommodations on it and modifications, but the sports IEP does not. And so I'm here today because um, when we, I went to the Woodlands High School and I spoke to three different people, I asked them, do you know if you can have accommodations on sports IEPs and no one knew anything about it. So that's what brings me here today. I'm trying to, I'm requesting to, for you to uh, expedite this process. So what I'm about to talk about is just trying to give you facts and background as to why um, IEPs or, or why uh, uh, an IEP can have accommodations for sports and ex extracurricular activities. So her IEP doesn't include any accommodations, modifications, supports, or related services for extracurricular activities or school sports. So I am here to gain approval for Inez to be allowed to swim with the Woodlands High School swim team during JV practice. As I say, I've spoken with three members. They were unaware that IEPs can include accommodations for and school sports. So Inez had a tryout at the Woodlands High School for the swim team without any modifications for school sports from her IEP. And prior to that, I had emailed the coach and I said she has an IEP and so she has a learning disability and so her learning disability is um, for emotional disturbance so her modifications on a regular IEP are that she gets a lot of extra time she gets extra time to complete assignments she gets extra time to take tests so I'm trying to use that as probably the um, special service that a related service that would or support, related support, sorry the darkness distracted me. Um, trying to use that as the related support so that um, she can be allowed to swim. So again, I'm trying to be as clear as I can. So she, she went to the tryout and it's an excessive tryout. Um, compared to all the other high schools in the district, no one has to swim 50, 20, no, sorry, 20 laps of 50 within 15 minutes. Most of the tryouts are a lot less than that. Um, last year she swam for Conroe, I'm sorry, she swam for College Park, and their tryout is basically a 500, which is 10 laps, and demonstration of being able to do the strokes. But it doesn't have that time constraint. But the main thing I want to say is that she completed this tryout. So, um, so her IEP provides accommodations for extra time on every assignment and test. Um, her measurable annual goals discuss role playing with an LSSP. So what they do is that since her learning disability is more of a processing problem, she'll learn how to get back on track after avoiding a required task. And that's why I'm trying to think, you know, why is it she's not swimming fast enough? What, what is it? You know, and I think it is a processing issue, you know, and I think that she does need to practice more. So again, with these measurable annual goals, the first goal for Inez will begin tasks with fewer than five prompts. So I just want to give you a little background on her. So the, her disability affects her processing abilities and then, and then her ability to play some sports is affected. So she needs to be specifically coached to get to the coach's expectations. So not allowing her to participate contra contradicts the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which prohibits the exclusion of persons with disabilities from activities at schools which receive federal funds. Another example is the GAO has issued guidance letters for equal access. The DOE completed a large study in 2011 um, another one is rights law, Department of Education guidance on legal <coughs> obligations for ec extracurricular activities. So there's another example of a Minnesota school district held that IE, IDEA requires school districts to take steps to provide extracurricular and non-academic activities to affect the student and give an equal opportunity to participate. Is that my five minutes? Yes, Ms. Okay. Martin, sorry. So um, it's also saying that uh, it's, it's included in the FAPE, like if you deny her, then um, 
you're denying her a FAPE. So as I say, I'm just asking the board to expedite the process of her being allowed to swim. The coach Wade said that she could uh, try out again in January, but if anybody knows anything about swimming is that they need to constantly practice or else you never improve on any time. And that's really all I want her to do is just swim. It just doesn't have to be, you know, some star. And that's all I came for. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Thank you. Ms. Ward. Scott Goldman. Good evening. Um, I'm not here for a complaint. I'm here for a request or a plea. As all y'all are aware, the CISD guidelines provide that junior high schools can be named after a prominent person or public official who has served the district or community with distinction. I can think of no other person uh, that meets those requirements and has more, shown more distinction in that area than Reuben W. Hope, Jr. And let me tell you why. Y'all have all been provided with information about Reuben Hope. It goes on for pages. There's articles about Reuben. You often got these sheets that have bullet points. But Reuben Hope and his wife came to Montgomery County in 1973, and they raised three children here, all that went through the CISD system. All of them graduated from Conroe High School. Reuben was involved with their education. He was involved in their extracurricular activities. He was president of the Conroe uh, High School Athletic Booster Club. And he's been involved in numerous community activities, Montgomery County Fair Association, uh, different area youth league, uh, uh, mainly baseball, um, deacon at uh, First Baptist Church here in Conroe. The list goes on and on. <coughs> he was chairman of the Citizens for the Law Enforcement Committee that came up with our current center for our jail um, and uh, the Sheriff's Department. Professionally, he started his own law firm in 1973, which is now known as uh, Hope and Cause EPC. He was board certified in uh, personal injury trial law. He was president of the Montgomery County Bar Association, voted attorney of the year in 1991. He's been appointed by the state uh, uh, bar of Texas as the state bar grievance committee where he served for five years. Other than his law partner, there's no attorney in Montgomery County that has tried more Reuben, uh, uh, civil cases than Reuben Hope. Not one attorney in Montgomery County other than his law partner. And he has hired and mentored uh, some very fine attorneys in Montgomery County, such as Judge Charles Crager, who's now one of the justices on the Ninth Court of Appeals in Beaumont, myself, Scott Goldman, Steve Weisinger, Jimmy Jones, Nelda Blair, Kenneth Siler, Richard Judge, Ray Burgess, Tim Bowersox, and his law, law partner, John Causey. But he's had more than just an impression or involvement in the community, more than just an impression and involvement in the legal profession. He has served CISD. As y'all are aware, from 1996 to 1999, he was a member of the Board of Trustees for the CISD, held the position of Vice President, and served with fellow members Gerald Irons, Rob Eisler, Joe B. Kaufman, Hans Snyder, and Alan Moore. But he went beyond Conroe. He went beyond CISD. He went beyond Montgomery County and was elected in 1999 as the District 16 State Representative. He served for eight years before retiring from the legislature. But I think some of his key accomplishments in the legislature really had an impact on education, including the No Child Left Behind program and increases in teacher pay and benefits. He authored and passed into law the Lone Star Groundwater Conservation District and creation of an additional county court at law here in Montgomery County. He served two terms as chairman of the House Republican Caucus Majority Leader. Many committees, such as the Select Committee on Public School Finance, appropriations, civil practices, natural resources, and budgets and oversight. There was an editorial in the Conroe Courier entitled, In Hope We Trusted. Reuben Hope delivered. 
He delivered for Conroe. He delivered for CIST. He delivered for Montgomery County. And he delivered for the state of Texas. On July 3, 2015, Reuben cast away. And Conroe, CISD, Montgomery County, and the state of Texas lost a great leader and a great servant. So on behalf of the Hope family, on behalf of his law partner, John Causey, myself, and many other people, we'd ask you to really consider naming this new junior high school after Reuben Hope. Why? Why now? Why Reuben? We all know those junior high kids, they're young, they have young minds. And they're going to look up on that building and they're going to see Reuben W. Hope Jr. And they're going to want to know who is this man? What did he do to get his name on this building? And when they research and they learn about Reuben Hope and they see what he accomplished, it's going to be, it's going to give them an aspiration to achieve the things that he's achieved in his lifetime and to benefit Conroe, CISD, and this community. So we request that y'all strongly consider and name this new junior high school after Ruby and W. Hope Jr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Item three is a consent agenda. I've had no request to remove any items. Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve? I move we approve as presented. Second. All right, all those in favor? <coughs> Item 4A, receive elementary and secondary summer school report, Dr. Knoll. All right, Dr. Phillips and Mr. Colshan present this item. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Null. Uh, Greg Colshan and I appreciate the opportunity to share information regarding our summer school programs that have recently wrapped up. Um, our teams have been very busy this summer, but most importantly, our kids have had a great time learning. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about the elementary program, and then Mr. Colshan will fill you in on the secondary. So our elementary program offered seven different programs, and I'll go into a little more detail in just, just a bit. But first off, I've, I've got to acknowledge Dr. Shelly Winkler. Shelly. She uh, has been instrumental in coordinating our summer school programs. And it's, it's hard to imagine, but our, just our summer school program is, is bigger than a lot of districts' full-time program. And so it takes a lot of coordination um, with our CNI team and uh, Dr. Upshaw, working closely with finance, HR, transportation, child nutrition, special ed, assessment. Everyone pulls together to pull this off. And we're just really... Dr. Dr. Philip, I'm sorry, you mm -hmm. said Dr. Winkler. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're I'm very, sorry. very Thank proud you. for her. Thank you for <laughs> noting that. Thank you. So, and of course, um, we couldn't accomplish anything without our great uh, principal, summer school principals. And I went ahead and let them go on home. Yes. Some of them had their children with them, and, and we weren't sure when it was going to come back on. But we really want to acknowledge these great leaders. Um, they made it very easy. Mm -hmm. Um, so well, our first program that we're going to talk about a little bit is the Passport to Learning and the um, and tuition based Kid Quest program. This targeted kids in first through sixth grade, and it's basically just to help kids in the areas of reading, writing, math, and science. You can see our summer school program took place from June 6th through June 28th. It was a half day program. Um, we had over a thousand students. Uh, that were at our Title I portion of the program, and then we had 54 students that paid tuition for a total of 1,163 kids in this particular program. The bilingual program is uh, required by federal law to be offered for pre-K and kinder. In Conroe, we're, we're um, very fortunate to be able to extend this to our first and second grade bilingual students as well, and we serve 936 kids in this program. English is a second language program, very similar to our bilingual program, uh, targeting children whose language is other than Spanish. And uh, we had 263 students in this program. 
and a reading and math camp that we have every summer to provide intensive targeted reading and math intervention for fifth grade students. Typically this program is for students that need to take the, the STAR test the third time. Uh, we were excused from that due to Hurricane Harvey, but we still had the program to help get kids prepared for, for next year. 339 students served. KidQuest in Re Richmond this year was robotics, very popular. Um, we had 50 students that participated in that on two different campuses. And extended school year services, it's a program for children with disabilities. Um, the goal is to help them um, maintain critical skills and not regress over the summer. And so we had 43 youngsters involved in that. Just a little uh, summary of the funding. You can see that the majority of the funding came from Title I, federal Title I funds, and then also Title III funding. Um, with a little bit of money coming in from local sources and uh, um, tuition for a total of $1,221,192. So as a summary, we had in, in elementary 2,794 students. We were housed on eight campuses. We employed 225 teachers, 45 paraprofessionals, and 14 great administrators. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Koshin. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Uh, at the secondary level, we served uh, junior high and high school students on four campuses. We have a couple of the principals still here tonight. Uh, Julia Venghaus uh, served junior high students from Irons, Knox, McCullough, and York at the Oak Ridge ninth grade campus. And Brad Milam ran our summer, high school summer school program at Luke, uh, McCullough in serving all high school students from across the district. Uh, two other locations, Dr. Demetra Phipps led the junior high school session at Conroe 9, serving students from Moorhead, Pete, Washington. And then finally, uh, Pete Junior High hosted our extended year service for our high school students, and that was headed by Angela Reagan. Uh, we had a variety of program types. First, uh, in an effort to help students reach their academic goals this summer, uh, we presented a variety of opportunities for them. From a secondary perspective, summer school is very important to help students stay on track to graduate on time. Uh, at the high school level, we offered initial credits that allow both junior high and senior high school students the opportunity to take courses required for graduation. This provides space in their schedule for electives during the school year, uh, allows them to uh, increase the number of honors and dual credit and AP classes available to them, allows space for athletics, fine arts, and other extracurricular programs uh, that they may not have had, and it also creates an opportunity for potential early graduation. We also offered high school credit recovery, uh, which allows students to recover credits which they have lost during the, the school year. And 45 Conroe ISD students were able to complete their graduation requirements this summer in summer school and receive their diplomas at the August graduation. Um, we also, also, also offered online accelerated math credit through Pearson Grad Point, junior high school credit recovery, along with the eighth grade Star Academy, high school and junior high ESL academies, uh, GED programs in both English and Spanish, and our extended school year program for our, our special needs students. Uh, we offered first time credit offerings in seventh grade math, eighth grade pre-algebra, algebra one, and pre-AP geometry. And then you can see the list of initial credit offerings um, that many of our junior high students take advantage of and have high school credits before they enter the doors as freshmen. Uh, a summary, uh, there were 1,332 uh, courses taken by 828 students, and as you can see, uh, many students took advantage of the summer opportunity and took more than one credit opportunity. 127 students uh, took online accelerated math courses, 349 total students attended the junior high school summer programs, 57 students participated in the extended year program, 38 students attended GED classes, 25 students participated in the ESL Academy. Uh, of those course, uh, students who took uh, courses for credit, 98% of them were successful and earned the credit they were seeking. 644 initial high school credits were earned by junior high and high school students, and 724 repeat credits were earned by high school students. 
uh, financial summary. Um, most of the funding came out, out of uh, tuition collected, a little bit out of Title I and some local sources. The total expense for summer school was $509,897. Um, to summarize, we had four locations, uh, 106 teachers, 31 paraprofessionals, three counselors, nine nurses, four instructional coaches, uh, four testing coordinators, and eight administrators. Uh, over 4,500 uh, 4, students uh, participated in the overall summer schools, both elementary and secondary. It was a busy summer. Yes, it was a busy summer. Successful. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you, Mr. Colson. Item 5A, receive presentation on submitted names for Flex School 19 and New Junior High in the Conrad Feeder Zone. Dr. Knoll. All right, Dr. Hines, present that list to us. Good evening again, President Bush, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Knoll. Uh, this is the, uh, I guess, the second presentation out of what will be three. And so uh, just to go back a little bit, last month we brought to you um, the process was beginning for the naming, and we would take public comments. We started that in uh, July, and we just closed that out uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, so we've taken public suggestions, and we, we have made a copy of the list for you. Um, and then we will, uh, again, present those suggestions to you this evening, uh, which you may choose from, and certainly it's your prerogative to not choose from as well. Uh, we had 302 submissions for Flex 19 and 501 submissions for the junior high names. Again, just a reminder, Flex 19 will open up next fall, and it's uh, located just south of 242. In, on Harper School Road. Uh, there's a rendering, and uh, these are the names that uh, came in. Obviously, there were multiple versions of many of them. I want to present those to you. Mm. Dr. Winkler, you're on here again. Yeah. She made the list. Yeah. Yeah. And then the junior high school, which is going to be located on the same site as Patterson and Bosman in a future high school. Uh, is uh, the other school that's up. That will open up a year later. It'll open up in the uh, fall of 2020. And so, uh, again, we're uh, taking names, and these were the suggestions that we received online for your consideration. And just a reminder, um, I'll be back uh, next month, and we'll have two items on the agenda. One will be a, a, an information item in case you want to discuss um, the item uh, in terms of names, and then the second item will be the action item for the actual naming of the campuses if you choose to do that. And we have the full list here to take home and read over reasonings and review. I know that those lists were not comprehensive of everything that is in our packet, correct? correct? Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hines. All right. Item 5B, Receive Capital Improvements Update. Dr. Knoll. All right. Mr. Foster. <coughs> Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It's my pleasure to bring forward uh, for you an update on our capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. I'm going to start with Grand Oaks High School, as I'm happy to report this will be our final update as we open this building for use by our students on Wednesday last week. So it is serving our students just as it's intended to as we speak. Uh, likewise, with Catherine Johnson Clark Intermediate School, it also opened on Wednesday when we started school for this school year, and it is also serving students, so this will be our final update for this project as well. Our life cycle 2018 project, this is a project we use to replace things that were out over time. So a representative picture of some of the work we did uh, over the course of this project. This was a rebranding of the York Junior High as it is now part of the Grand Oaks High School Feeder Zone. 
Uh, overall, we've touched 31 campuses on this project. They're still wrapping up some details at McCullough Junior High, but overall, we got everything done that we needed to get done to get school started uh, without fail on Wednesday last week. At Safety and Security, which is our project where we spent the summer really working on our security vestibules. So we have now, uh, during the course of this project, touched all of our elementaries, intermediates, uh, most of our junior highs, and a couple of our ninth grade campuses where we have a secure vestibule at the front of those buildings now. The representative picture here is from Giesinger Elementary. You can see as they got it done, put it back together, so it didn't open uh, on Wednesday, just like the rest of the campuses did. Uh, the project does continue on. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up around December of this year. Uh, from this point forward, the work is mainly above the ceiling, so it's afternoons, evenings, and weekends, uh, so that we're upgrading the cameras and views and servers and things of that nature, along with our access control and our uh, uh, video cameras in those buildings. At Flex 19, this project is on schedule. Uh, we've gone vertical, as okay. we'd like to say, so the steel is on the site being erected. The building slab continues as we uh, work, uh, work to complete that building. And like I said, it is on schedule, scheduled to open in August of 2019. So this time next year, we should be giving you that report that it opened without fail. At Austin Elementary, where we're doing a building addition to remove some of the older portions of that building from service, uh, they've reached the end of their useful life. Uh, that building is progressing just as, we'd, as we're planning. So it is on schedule. So you're looking at a photograph of the gray <coughs> beams for the new exterior walls as we extend that building to the rear of the campus. And when you, oh, back up. Uh, one of the things that we have done over the course of the summer is increase the parking lot and driveway capacity around the edges of that building. So the, we have, now have the traffic is still flowing the way it normally did before we started the renovation but the parent traffic gets further off of highway 105 on what will be the future bus loop and as we complete that project over the course of this year this coming summer we'll move that parent drop off to the other side of the building uh, as we reorient that building for its new new situation on the campus but it is on schedule we're going to finish the building as we approach the summer of this year mm -hmm. and then we'll spend next summer Demol demolishing the existing buildings that were that were intended to tear down to recreate the front yard of that campus. At Irons Junior High, where we're doing a classroom addition, you can see from the outside that building is coming along very nicely. So the the exterior of the building is is in progress, getting ready to what we call a dry in period. On the inside of that building, you see the masonry, the building systems, and things of that nature coming together. The project is on schedule, it's scheduled to turn over for our students to use when they return from the winter break uh, this coming uh, January. Our new junior high school, uh, which is uh, Dr. Uh, Hines just said is right behind uh, Bosman Intermediate. Uh, that process you can see is starting to take shape from our aerial view. You can see the site is mainly established. So we're working on the parking lot as well as the building and other areas of that campus. Uh, the focus on the parking lots to give us enough staging area so that weather becomes less and less of a factor as we move on through that building. It is on schedule, scheduled to open in August of 2020. At Conroe High School, where we're doing a building addition that helps us facilitate a renovation of the main campus. Uh, the building addition is on schedule, so it's scheduled to turn over like irons at the winter break. So when the students return from winter break, uh, they will be able to have class in this building. So you can see from the outside of this one, it is starting to, to close up completely. So on the inside of the building, you're starting to see it brighten up. So the air conditioning systems are running, the lights are on, the life safety systems are going in. And as you can see from our classrooms, are starting to come together as well. So casework and finishes and things of that nature are, are in progress so we can meet our schedule and turn that building over during the winter break. And that is our update. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Item 6A, consider approval of the 2018-2019 official school budget. All right, we'll bring Mr. Rice forward for these next few items. Yes, good evening again, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to recommend the Board of Trustees approve the 2018-2019 official school budget as presented and discussed in the public hearing and as recommended by the district level planning and decision making committee. At this time, I recommend your approval of the 2018-2019 official school budget. So move. I second the motion. Any discussion? I just Involved. want to make a comment. It was very nice, obviously, that the community feels uh, that we're running a pretty good school district. In fact, I'd say a pretty good, efficient, 
uh, school district, the fact that we've got the good ratings. Uh, we had no comments during the, the, the community comment time, I think is, it says a lot for our school district and what we're doing. Great. All right, all those in favor? The budget has been adopted. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Item 2B, I know, is another one for you. Consider, adopt, and set by order resolution the 2018 Avalorum tax rate. Yes, tonight I'm recommending that the Board of Trustees approve the attached order resolution to adopt a 2018 tax rate of $1.06 for maintenance and operations and $0.22 cents for debt service per $100 of taxable valuation to fund the 2018-2019 official school budget. As, as has been presented and discussed, the above noted tax rates are required to fund the maintenance and operation and debt service budgets for the 2018-2019 fiscal year. The total combined tax rate of $1.28 per $100 value is the same as the prior year. At this time, I recommend your approval of the 2018 tax rate. So move. Wait, hold um, on. Oh, we no. have a specific. Got a specific. Yeah. <laughs> <That's what's laughs> I move that the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of $1.28 per $100, which is effectively a 2.25% increase in the tax rate. I'll second that. Uh, um, I want to clarify, and, and we really want this to be noted, we are staying with the same rate. Due to legislation, it has to read that it's increased because of the appraised values going up. And so this is not a tax rate increase. And so we always want to make sure we're being very clear on that when we read this motion, because it can be very confusing if people don't know that. Um, also, as we've discussed in detail, we're adopting the MNO at 1.06 this year and debt service at 0.22 for one year due to the Harvey disaster recovery that we're able to capitalize on. And so you know, next year this rate will default back down and we will automatically go back to the 1.04 and the 0.24 for debt service. So I want that very clear on the record. I know we said that in the public hearing, but it needs to be very much noted. And as you're out in the public talking to people, I appreciate you saying that as well. So <laughs> any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item C, consider transfer of unassigned fund balance to debt service fund. Mr. Rice. Yes. I'm recommending the Board of Trustees approve the attached resolution authorizing the transfer of $10 million of unassigned fund balance to the debt service fund. The above noted fund balance transfer of $10 million is required to service the debt during the 2018-2019 fiscal year and minimize the 2018-2019 tax rate. I recommend the board approve the fund balance transfer as set out in the attached resolution. So move. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Motion passes. Item 6D, consider 41, chapter 41 status, consider a option selection for property wealth reduction per resident student. Mr. Rice. Yes, I am recommending the Board of Trustees select option three, which is purchase attendance credits from the state to reduce its wealth per resident student. Conroe Independent School District's wealth per resident student and weighted average daily attendance is estimated by TEA at $460,133. Conroe ISD's wealth level falls between the equalized wealth levels of $319,500 and $514,000 as established by the TEC. Districts whose identified wealth level falls between $319,500 and $514,000 per WADA are not required to pay recapture. Under current law, a district with a property wealth per WADA above $319,500 must select one of the following five options to reduce its wealth per resident students. We are recommending option three, which is purchase attendance credits from the state. Since Conroe ISD's wealth per resident students has not reached the recapture equalized wealth level of $514,000, the selection to reduce our wealth per resident student is simply an administrative procedure. TEA recommends that districts in our property wealth position choose option three since it is the least extreme of the choices available. The district feels that option three is the most appropriate selection. 
Uh, just for clarification, CISD will not have to send money to the state. And we have chosen this option for the past 10 years since we've been Chapter 41. At this time, I recommend the board select option three, purchase attendance credits from the state to reduce our wealth per resident student. So moved. Second. All right. Any questions, discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. And then item 6E, receive financial reports. Mr. Rice. Yes, I'm here to present the financial statements for the district for the month of July. These statements will include our general fund, debt service, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. And the first statement we'll look at this evening is our balance sheet. Our balance, our balance sheet includes our assets, our liabilities, and our fund balances. And each month, we like to take a look at our cash and investments. And we like to concentrate on our general fund. It shows we have cash on hand of $500. We have bank deposits of $153,000. We have investments in the state pools of $57.9 million. We have investments with Wood Forest National Bank at a little over $30 million. We have our shorter term investments. That's investments that are less than one year at $59 million. And our longer term investments that are managed by TCG Investment Advisors are $51.8 million for total cash <coughs> investments of $199.3 million. The next statement we'll look at this evening is our income statement. Our income statement includes our revenues and expenditures for the district. Revenues are broken down into three categories. That includes local and intermediate sources, our state program revenues, and our federal program revenues. Taking a look at the detail of our local and intermediate sources, we can see that property taxes is the largest generator of revenues in our general fund and debt service, food sales for our food service, and premium contributions in our self-funded insurance. We can also look at our expenditures year to date by major category for each of the funds. The largest expenditure in the general fund is payroll and debt service. It is debt service. Child nutrition, it is supplies and materials. And it's contracted services and self-funded insurance. Our projected fund balance uh, for the general fund, we're still projecting an increase of about $2.3 million in our fund balance this year for general fund. And child nutrition, just a slight decrease of $153,000. We had a lot of kitchen renovations we did this, this summer, so uh, just a slight decrease in that, in that fund balance. This is our 2015 bond referendum status update. We have currently expended and encumbered $469 million of our 2015 bond referendum. We have an estimate to complete of an additional $55.3 million, leaving us with a contingency of about $4.1 million. Self-funded insurance, as we look at the month of July, the summer months we know are, are, are pretty strong against us. We had total revenues of $3.9 million. We had total expenses of $4.6 million, leaving our revenues under expenses of about $700,000 for the month. Overall, our plan, we have total revenues of $43.9 million. Our expenses has been $41.8 million. So our, so our plan is actually a little, about $2 million to the good so far. Uh, participation at our wellness centers remains strong. Um, we are averaging about 523 visits per month, so that's picking up and it's remaining strong. Our investments for the month. Par value uh, is $467 million. Our pools are yielding about 2.18%. Our investments with Wood Forest National Bank, 2.17%. Our shorter term investments, like I said, less than a year, 1.88%. Our longer term investments with TCG Investment Advisors is earning 1.6%. Our combined portfolio has a WAM of 50 days and it's yielding 2.08%. Our benchmark, which is the 90 day T bill, is at 1.96%. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. All right. Ms. Gladys, you have us busy tonight. Item 9A. <laughs> Consider local policy manual update 111 and revisions to local board policies, DEC, FDA, and FDB. Yes, you guys got the stack because I know you've been eating things to read at night. And so I know you've been perusing these as have our staff here at CISD. Yep. You'll notice in the beginning of those, you've got the red line versions of the local policies, and those are the ones that I'm going to tell you about within update 111 tonight. None of them are very exciting, I hate to tell you, but. Um, the, the majority of changes are prompted by um, alterations to the Texas Administrative Code, and they're just implementing those changes that were made. Um, 
the one you'll see soon is that the announcement of board member training will occur right before the general election as opposed to uh, the end of the year, which makes, I think, a little bit more sense. Um, another um, adds, adds clarifying language that any employee in the district, not just employees who drive vehicles, can be tested for reasonable suspicion drug testing if they display symptoms that would indicate they might be under the influence of something. Um, there's been clarification added to um, the compulsory attendance law about students who are able to make up um, absences and once they reach 17 if they're going to um, uh, once they complete high school and have four absences and then we have three um, other local policies that we've included that were not in update 111 um, just to me do a little cleaning up DEC is our leave policy we want to take out some of the language in the policy that's more procedural and move it to the procedure manual that relates to when we'll send notices and things like that the other two policies are the intra and inter-district transfer policies. Mm -hmm. We had tried changing, giving people more time to submit their transfer requests. We, we made it to July 1st, but we found that we were unable to really um, complete our allocations accurately and thus leaving people hiring folks at the last minute because they didn't really know who was gonna be on there. So we would like to move that back to May 1st, which where it was for years. And so those are the recommendations that we'll be asking you to adopt um, next month. Thank you. Thank you. Item 9B, consider authorizing the district to initiate litigation to resolve dispute over failed roof at Knox Junior High School. Madam President, I would move that the board authorize the district to initiate litigation against GAF for breach of warranty and other related claims. Second. All in favor? Motion passes. Item 9C, consider amendment to the 2017 life cycle project GMP to re-roof a portion of Knox Junior High School. Madam President, I move that the board move approve to, an amendment to the GMP for the 2017 life cycle project to re-roof Knox Junior High School and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the change order documents. Second. Second the motion. All those in favor. Item 9D, consider purchase of approximately 18 acre site in the Caney Creek feeder zone. I move that the board approve the purchase of approximately 18 acres in the Caney Creek feeder zone for a school site under the terms previously discussed and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the documents necessary to effectuate the transaction. Second. All those in favor. And item 9E, nominate a candidate to fill a vacancy on the 2018-2019 Montgomery Central Appraisal District Board. Madam, Pres Madam President, I move the nomination of Jamie Meach as a candidate to fill a vacancy on Montgomery County, on the Montgomery County Appraisal District Board of Directors. I second that. Um, real quick, I just, I did have a question and I, I wanted to ask this. I know we we get a percentage of votes once all the nominations come out and so it doesn't work that way for this okay so how does this is, work <laughs> this, so this is okay. special Any jurisdiction can nominate one candidate okay in, in within the appraisal district's boundaries then the remaining board of directors will get that list of nominees and they will select oh, okay the replacement director from that list of nominees. okay and they will do that i believe in september wonderful i just wanted clarification because i don't think we've ever we've really en encountered yeah. this case so all right thank you um any other questions all those in favor motion passes now we're going to go back into executive session <laughs> A closed session of the board will now be held. Adjourn for just adjourn, a adjourn, and then and then go into executive. Yes. Okay. So we will take a momentary adjournment at seven fifty-one. <laughs>